Howdy. My name is Nonat, and welcome to my deep dive into the Goblin Ancestry for Pathfinder 2nd Edition. If this is your first time watching one of my Ancestry deep dives, they're pretty simple. We go over the base starting stats of the Ancestry, as well as looking at every heritage and every Ancestry feat from levels 1 through 20. There's not a whole lot to say. We're talking about goblins, everyone's favorite little green men. Well, maybe second favorite. But the goblin does stand out a little bit. Being a core ancestry to Pathfinder, it differentiates itself from its older brother D&D. Goblins have been and still are a staple ancestry in the Pathfinder universe, so let's go ahead and check out what makes them tick. Starting off, most goblins are among the most fragile of the ancestries with only six base hit points. This sort of harkens back to their history as the weakest and lowest level enemies for a lot of new campaigns. They are considered small creatures, but do still have a land speed of 25 feet. They begin with a boost to their dexterity and charisma, because you know goblins, while not necessarily smooth talkers, have very powerful personalities. They also get a free ability boost, of course, and their ability flaw is to wisdom. This makes a lot of sense, honestly, because goblins, while not inherently stupid, don't necessarily make the wisest decisions. They can speak common and goblin, have the goblin and humanoid traits, and actually begin with full dark vision. This is a solid step up, as a lot of ancestries usually only have low light vision and need to take a feat to gain dark vision. Now for the real fun stuff, the goblin heritages. Starting off, Charhide is your classic elemental resistant heritage. Although this one actually does it a bit differently. Charhide goblins are specifically resistant against actual flames, not against heat itself. So they do still gain a resistance to fire damage equal to half their level, but unlike the other elemental resistant heritages, they don't treat heat conditions as one less. Instead, the flat check to put out persistent fire damage is reduced to DC 10 instead of DC 15. Additionally, like normal, that DC is reduced by a further 5 if somebody assists you in putting it out. So if you have someone helping to put out the flames around you, you only need to make a DC 5 flat check to put out persistent fire damage. Iron Gut Goblins are amazingly flavorful, though not a good flavor. <laughs> That's a joke, they're amazingly flavorful. Uh, so long as you have access to consistent amounts of garbage, say you find a dump in a city, you can survive and eat and never go hungry without even needing to roll to subsist. This is because Iron Gut Goblins really don't get sick that often. In fact, even if they are sick and have the sickened condition, they can still eat and drink things. Speaking of sickened, they get a plus two circumstance bonus versus effects that inflict sickened and gain plus two to remove sickened. They also get a plus two saving throw against all afflictions, which keep in mind, afflictions are poisons, diseases, and curses. Now there is a caveat to all of this, as this all only applies if the affliction was derived from something you ingested. So if you get cut and inflicted by an injury poison, you're not going to get this save. But if you were to, say, eat a cursed gemstone and swallow it, and then you get afflicted by the curse you do get your plus two against that curse saving throw. Razor Tooth is super simple. You get a 1d6 Jaws attack that deals piercing damage. It's an unarmed attack in the Brawling Weapon group that has the finesse and unarmed traits. Snow Goblin is just like our other classic elemental resistance. Half your level in resistance to cold damage, as well as treating cold weather conditions as one step less extreme. And Unbreakable is why I said most goblins are fragile. If you take the Unbreakable Goblin Heritage, you increase your starting Ancestry hit points from 6 to 10. Now, in the long run, this little plus 4 hit points isn't going to mean a lot. But in a low-level campaign, levels 1 to 5, 4 extra hit points is really solid. You also treat all falls as half as far as you actually fell, so you're just really hard to kill. Tailed Goblins from the Lost Omens character guide are also known as the best goblins because you get to have a tail. You get plus two to your athletics checks to climb. Additionally, you also get the combat climber bonus feat, and you only need one free hand to climb, and you don't even need a free hand to trip, as you can wrap your tail around someone's leg and pull it out from under them. It's freaking awesome. 
Tree Dweller Goblins are pretty simple. You get a plus two circumstance bonus to stealth checks if you're trying to hide or sneak in the woods, to survival checks to subsist in the woods, and to your survival DC to cover your own tracks. And now, as always, we get to the ancestry feats, the most fun part of these videos, at least for me. Starting off with the probably most recognizable goblin ancestry feat of Burn It, which surprisingly does not need to be a Charhide goblin heritage. All of your spells or alchemical items that deal fire damage gain a small bonus to damage equal to half the spells level or one quarter of the items level. All of your persistent fire damage also deals one extra damage per tick. Also, the bonus to spells or alchemical items cannot go below one, so even a first level alchemical item is dealing plus one fire damage. City Scavenger is a great feat if you're going to be in a lot of cities. You can roll society or survival to subsist inside of a city, as well as gaining a plus one to that check. On top of that, when you subsist in this way in a city, you can also make a society or survival check to earn income. Once again, this gets a plus one circumstance bonus to the check, and you just get to scrounge around and find money. It's really, really cool and flavorful. Again, though, if you're not in a city, it's not going to have any use. Also, if you happen to be an Iron Gut Goblin, all of these checks get plus two instead of plus one. So you can make some decent money this way. Goblin lore. There's always a lore skill. You become trained in nature and stealth. Obviously, if you're already trained in either of these skills, you can pick another skill to replace them, and you get the Goblin Lore skill. Solid stuff. Goblin Scuttle is honestly really great, either for closing the distance or creating distance. If your ally ends their movement directly next to you, you can use your reaction to take the step action. And remember that stepping does not provoke attacks of opportunity, so this is amazing for positioning, especially if you're a class, like I always say, that doesn't already have a reaction. If you're a cleric or a wizard, then being able to step and reposition yourself is always useful. Everybody's favorite goblin feat, even though in my opinion, it's pretty trash. It's just hilarious. Goblin Song. For one action, you attempt a performance check against one target's will DC so long as they're within 30 feet. Should you critically succeed your performance check against their will DC, they take a minus one status penalty to perception checks and will saves for one minute. It's an okay effect. Should you normal succeed, they only take the penalty for one round, and should you critically fail, they're immune to your song for one hour. What is nice is as your proficiency with performance goes up, you can target more creatures. Two creatures if you're an expert, four if you're a master, and eight targets if you're legendary in performance. This does have its uses. This can combo really well with other party members or even other ones of your own spells. Additionally, once you succeed against them once, all future Goblin Song attempts have that minus one to their will DC of a higher chance to succeed, or more importantly, critically succeed. You can sort of think of this as a spell you can sustain, because you can use it on the following turn, and if you already reduce their will DC by one, your chance of critically succeeding goes up that much more. And even if you don't critically succeed, you can still use this every single turn to reduce their will DC against your other spells, or perhaps even your allies' spells. This is great in combination with the Days cantrip in particular. Goblin Weapon Familiarity. You gain access to the Dog Slicer and the Horse Chopper, two of the most brutally named weapons, and they're really cool. They're just sort of rusty junk weapons made by goblins, and I adore them. But other than that, it functions the exact same as all other Ancestral Weapon Familiarity feats. Junk Tinker is so much fun. It may not be useful after level 1 or 2, but it's still so fun to start out with. When you use the crafting skill to craft, you can make level 0 shoddy weapons. This reduces the price to craft it to one quarter, but of course, the weapons are shoddy. What does this mean? Well, a shoddy weapon gives a minus 2 to all attack rolls made with this weapon. However, because you have this Junk Tinker feat, any item you made yourself, you can ignore the shoddy penalty for. So basically, you can pretty quickly craft yourself replacement weapons for far cheaper than normal crafting, albeit they have to be level zero. Additionally, if you can incorporate junk into your crafting in some way, it actually saves another day of crafting, treating it as if you've been crafting for an additional day when it comes to price reduction. 
Crafting is honestly way too complicated to get more deep into it here, but uh, check out this video from Basics for Gamers right up there. Rough Rider is a must-have ancestry feat if you want a goblin with a mount dripping with flavor. First off, you get a plus one to your nature checks to command an animal. This bonus only applies to goblin dogs or wolves. Second off, what's really nice about this is if you were to take an animal companion that must have the mount trait, such as for the cavalier archetype or the champion's divine steed, you can instead opt to take a wolf. Even though it does not have the mount trait, this feat allows you to pick wolves for your mount, and it's so cool! Very Sneaky is a really solid upgrade to the base sneak action. First off, you can sneak 5 feet faster than normal. You can't sneak faster than your maximum speed, but you're usually sneaking at half speed, so 5 extra feet is huge. Additionally, should you end a sneak action not behind cover, you do not instantly become observed. As long as you end your turn behind cover, you stay hidden. So this means if there's two trees and 30 feet between them, well, one sneak action won't get you to the second tree. So normally you'd be caught. However, because you have the very sneaky feet, you can sneak halfway with one action and then finish it on the other action and remain hidden while making it to the other tree. Very, very good upgrade. Now, the Lost Omens character guide feats are some of the most just silly, over-the-top feats for goblins, and I love them. Starting off with Bouncy Goblin. You have to be an unbreakable goblin to take this. This feat doesn't do much on its own, but keep it in mind for later. Basically, you become trained in acrobatics, or another skill if you're already trained in acrobatics, and you gain a plus two bonus to tumble through a foe's space. Pretty good. Fang Sharpener is pretty great. If you are an Iron Gut Goblin, you get a 1d4 piercing jaw attack. And if you're already a Razor Tooth Goblin, your jaw attack goes from a 1d6 finesse unarmed jaw attack to a 1d8 jaw attack instead. It loses the finesse trait. No matter what heritage you are when you pick this, if you critically hit, you deal 1 persistent bleed damage per weapon damage die, so it's not a lot but it allows your jaw attack to get a little bit more useful. That persistent damage can really stack up if it doesn't go away. And what's important to keep in mind about jaw attacks in particular, they can't take those away from you. Unless they knock the teeth out of your face or cover your mouth somehow, they can't disarm you. It's really easy to, to take your weapon or tie your hands, but to stop you from biting, that's a lot harder. Hard Tail. If you are a Tailed Goblin, your tail becomes a 1d6 bludgeoning damage attack similar to a whip. What's absolutely hilarious is this is stronger than an actual whip. A normal whip is only 1d4, whereas your tail is 1d6. I think the whip is also slashing damage. Now looking at the Goblin Ancestry feats from the APG, Extra Squishy. Once again, only for the Unbreakable Goblin. This is very similar to Bouncy Goblin. You once again become trained in acrobatics, but this time, should you roll a normal success when taking the Squeeze action to squeeze into a tight space, you automatically crit succeed. Additionally, while in a tight space you've squeezed into, you get a plus four circumstance bonus to your Fortitude or Reflex DCs. If someone attempts to force you to move from your tight space, so if you get shoved or someone for some reason tries to trip you while you're wedged in somewhere, you get plus four to your DC, so you just can't be removed. It's great. And our final level one feat is honestly probably one of the strongest, Twitchy. You gain a plus one circumstance bonus to armor class against all hazards. Additionally, you just get a flat plus one circumstance bonus to all initiative rolls. The only downside on that is that this plus one circumstance bonus does not stack with the scout activity, as that is also a plus one circumstance bonus to initiative. Additionally, fun fact, take a shot every time I say additionally in one of these videos. You'll be wasted by the end. Additionally, if one of your opponents is using deception or diplomacy to roll initiative, your bonus to initiative becomes plus four? I don't really understand this, and I've never encountered an enemy that used diplomacy to roll initiative. Deception, maybe if they're a rogue, but I think this should have worked if they were rolling stealth, too. That would have made it a bit more usable and a bit more common to make use of that massive plus four bonus. 
Moving on to level 5, in the core rulebook, they got one level 5 feat, and that's Goblin Weapon Frenzy, which is just weapon specialization with goblin weapons. Kinda lame. Sorry, core rulebook. Lost Omens, however, gives us many more choices, starting with Ankle Bite. You have to have already taken the Fang Sharpener feat from level 1 to take this. Alternatively, you could just be a Razortooth Goblin, and you don't need that feat. Effectively, this grants the Goblin an Attack of Opportunity with their Jaws. However, this Attack of Opportunity can only be used when you are grabbed or restrained by a creature. Should you be grabbed or restrained by a body part of a creature, you can use your reaction to make a free Jaws unarmed attack on that part of the creature. Additionally, should you critically succeed with that Jaw strike, they lose their grip. So even if they beat your Fortitude DC and grabbed you, you still have another chance to A, deal some damage, and B, possibly make them fail. And obviously, since this is a reaction, no multiple attack penalty occurs or matters at all. This is a really good feat, y'all. An ancestry feat that gives you an attack of opportunity? Phenomenal. Chosen of Lamashtu is so cool, but unfortunately, Lamashtu is an evil god. So yes, technically a neutral goblin could make use of this, but... Chances are you're not going to be worshipping Lamashtu, and this is more for building NPCs. Nevertheless, it's an amazing feat. Choose one other goblin heritage and get its benefits. This is amazing. This means that any goblin could grow a tail or become a charhide or become an iron gut. I love it, and it's so cool, and it's so rare to see an ancestry let you take more than one heritage, and I'm so sad that it's locked specifically behind Lamashtu. I understand why, from a lore perspective, it makes sense, but man, it's something I wish I could see more often. Tailspin. Not that tailspin. For two actions, you can make one athletics check to trip two adjacent targets. Additionally, should either of these succeed, it counts as a critical success, even on normal successes. Now, this sounds only okay at first, but then you realize it's only one check, so you get to make two trip attempts at no multiple attack penalty. It still costs two actions, but being able to trip two targets at your full bonus and automatically crit succeed normal successes, this is fantastic. Though, you do have to be a Tailed Goblin, and you have to have taken the Hard Tail Ancestry feat at level 1. Torch Goblin is so ridiculous and over the top, and I love it. You have to be a Charhide Goblin in order to take this. And, on your turn, for one action, so long as you have access to some sort of open flame or incendiary device, you can light yourself ablaze. Like typical fire, you start taking 1d6 persistent fire damage every turn, but remember, you're a Charhide Goblin, so chances are you're reducing this by 2 or 3 per tick already, which means half the time, you're not taking any damage. So long as you're on fire, all of your melee strikes deal 1 additional fire damage per weapon damage die, so if you're attacking with a striking weapon, that's 2 extra fire damage on all of your attacks. Also, anytime a creature grapples, trip, shove, any kind of physical interaction with you, they take 1d6 fire damage for touching you. If they hit you with a melee weapon, their weapon takes 1d6 fire damage. This is a bunch of really, really good stuff for really no risk at all. The only downside is you can't opt out of your flames going out. You still have to make the check every turn to put the flames out, whether you want to or not. Tree Climber, only available to Tailed Goblins or Tree Dweller Goblins, gives you a climb speed of 10 feet. Additionally, at level 9, there is a feat called Cave Climber, and should you take that one, Tree Climber upgrades to give you a climb speed equal to your land speed. This is just really good, you know, not having to roll climb checks and just being able to climb without effort is amazing. Kneecap is an okay attack. For one action, you make a strike with any of your weapons or unarmed strike, and this attack deals no damage. It either inflicts a minus 10 foot status penalty or a minus 15 foot status penalty to speed on a critical hit. It only affects land speed and cannot reduce someone's speed below 5 feet like normal. I'm not sure why they made this so it doesn't deal damage. I think making this a two-action strike that deals your normal weapon damage would have been totally fair. You would, For two actions, you would strike and inflict a movement speed penalty. Maybe that would be too powerful? I'm not sure. But I'm kind of underwhelmed by this one. 
I think it could stand to deal a little bit of damage, you know? Because just inflicting a movement speed penalty isn't all that amazing. It's not bad, don't get me wrong, it has its uses. It's just not incredible. Loud Singer, a direct upgrade to Goblin Song. Your Goblin Song now has a range of 60 feet instead of 30 feet and can affect one additional target. Just in case, you know, you're going for that Goblin Song build where your goal is just to Goblin Song every single turn, which is somewhat viable. It's not good, but it's fun and it's somewhat helpful, you know, being able to drop everybody's will DC, pretty, pretty decent. At this level, you'll already be an expert, so that would let you attack three targets with Goblin Song every turn for one action. Vandal, you're really good at breaking things. You become trained in thievery, and whenever you make a strike against a trap or an object, you ignore five points of hardness. For those of you who aren't aware, an object's hardness reduces all physical damage it takes by that amount. And usually they only have a hardness of 5 to 10, especially if it's only made of wood or something like that. So ignoring five points of its hardness is actually pretty huge. This is perfect for a goblin that just wants to break through everything and can't be bothered to pick locks, which is hilarious that this makes you trained in thievery, but gives you the ability to break things. The aforementioned Cave Climber at level 9 gives you a climb speed of 10 feet when climbing cave walls. Now I should mention, the Tree Climber feat's ability that increases your climb speed to your land speed only works while climbing trees. You will not have your land speed as your climb speed on cave walls, only on trees. Skittering Scuttle is a massive upgrade to Goblin Scuttle from level 1. Obviously, you need the first level feat to take this, but now, instead of just taking a step action, you can opt to stride up to half your speed away. Keep in mind, this movement is not a careful step and will provoke attacks of opportunity. So, you can make your choice. If you're not threatened, you can just move half your speed in any direction. Really good options to have. Freeze It is an awesome ability, albeit I don't know why it works the way it does. As a Snow Goblin Heritage, you've learned the ability to just expel frost from your body to slow down your opponents. Make an athletics check against the Fortitude DC of an adjacent foe, and if you happen to be a master in athletics, you can do it against two foes. I don't know why this is athletics, I just don't think they had a better skill to use, I suppose. Should you critically succeed your athletics check against their Fortitude DC, they become clumsy too for one round. A normal success is clumsy one, and if you critically fail, they are immune for one minute. This is similar to Goblin Song, honestly, except it doesn't have a range, and rather than affecting will DCs, it affects every single one of their dexterity-based DCs and checks, including armor class. So should you just have an insane athletics check and you can reliably inflict a critical success with this, that's minus two to armor class, on top of if you can make them flat-footed or something like that. This has a lot of potential, I'll be honest. I just still don't know why. Why is it athletics? I don't have a better skill to use, but... Why? Hungry Goblin, you have to have taken the Fang Sharpener Ancestry feat from a lower level, and whenever you inflict persistent bleed damage with your jaw attacks, you gain temporary hit points equal to half your level for one minute. This is okay. Remember that the persistent bleed damage only happens on a critical hit, so if you're not critically hitting with your jaws, this feat is not doing anything for you. The nice thing is that they do last a full minute, so when it happens, you'll keep them for pretty much the rest of the encounter. It's fine. I think if you're playing your entire build around your jaws, like you're playing a goblin monk with a jaws attack, or even a goblin fighter, you could get some pretty good stuff out of this. Roll with it is... <laughs> the stupidest feat in the game, and that's why I love it. As a reaction, if you ever take a hit, specifically a melee weapon or unarmed strike, your foe can move you up to 30 feet in the direction of its choice. You can just get carried by the momentum of their attack and bounce off their attack in any direction. Now this is not good, as your foe controls this movement and this movement can trigger attacks of opportunity. On top of that, you fall prone and become stunned one, meaning you only have two actions on the following turn, one of which will probably be to stand up. Now the upside of this is you get a flat check. 
Should you roll a 6 or higher, the opponent's damage is automatically minimum. Which means if they were going to roll a d12 for damage, they will automatically roll a 1 for their damage. Should you roll a 16 or higher, and the attack that hit you was a critical, the attack is no longer deemed a critical hit. This is only for the purposes of damage, though. You don't take the double damage, but should the opponent have a critical specialization with their weapon, you will still suffer from that. Overall, this is hilarious. I love the idea of a goblin getting punched in the face and then just flying off like a big balloon. But the penalties associated with this reaction are just so severe. The opponent controls your movement, you're knocked prone, you're stunned one, and you still only have a chance to reduce the damage. Imagine going through all of that and then rolling a three on the dice. You just took full damage, and you're prone, and you're stunned one. I will say this reaction does get better as opponents start rolling more dice. If an opponent is going to roll 4d12 to hit you for a potential 48 damage before bonuses, you can reduce that 48 to 4. That's really good. But it's just incredibly, incredibly risky. But if that's how you like to play, more power to you. <laughs> Scalding Spit. You have to be a Charhide Goblin with the Torch Goblin Ancestry feat, but should you be on fire, you gain access to a 1d6 unarmed spit attack with a 30-foot range for 1d6 fire damage. I love this, honestly. A spit attack. Also, a ranged unarmed attack is very difficult to come by, so that has a lot of uses on its own. Remember that a Goblin Monk with this would be having all of their proficiency at range, which is huge. That last sentence was messy, but I'm too lazy to record it again, so I'm gonna leave it in. Again, we're getting to the really silly and unconventional feats. Cling. For one action, if your last action was a successful strike, you can just eh, grab onto your opponent. While you're grabbing them, if the target should move, you move with them. You can choose not to, and you can choose to let go at any point, but should they spend all three of their actions moving 75 feet away, you move with them the whole way, just clinging on to their leg. You also release them at the start of your next turn, or if they attempt an escape check. However, should they try an escape check, it's actually against your acrobatics DC, instead of your athletics. What's really cool about this is should you be a goblin with a jaw on arm strike, even if you don't have any free hands, if your last attack was a successful jaws strike, you can cling on with your teeth and just hang on like a dog in a cartoon. I love this feat, y'all. Level 13, we're almost done here. Goblin weapon expertise. Same as all the other weapon expertise, your proficiency goes up with goblin weapons when your proficiency would go up normally. As always, this feat is incredibly underwhelming, and I hate it. Very, very sneaky is insane. You can move up to your speed when you take the sneak action, and you no longer need to have cover to hide. I don't exactly know how this works, because you're still observed, so I don't know how you can hide or just disappear into the ether while someone's looking at you. This is going to be a lot of GM discretion, but I think this means as long as they haven't seen you yet, you can just blend in with your surroundings, because you are very, very sneaky. It's really strong. Your GM's just going to have to have a talk about how effective it actually is, because it's very, very vague. Video almost over. Not make subscribe joke yet. Down shiny button, press shiny thumb, click big red subscribe, very shiny. Type click clack in comment, talk about favorite goblin. Am I going insane? I might be going insane. 13th level unbreakable er goblin for the unbreakable goblin heritage. Your hit points from your ancestry increase to 20. This means that effectively when you hit 13th level, if you take this feat, you just gain 10 more hit points, which is insane. You are also now immune to fall damage, so you can jump off a freaking mountain and take no fall damage. And finally, should you have the bouncy goblin feet, whenever you hit the ground, you bounce back up half the distance you fell over and over and over again until you fall less than 20 feet. So should you jump off a 200-foot cliff, 
you will take no damage. You will bounce back up 100 feet. Fall again, take no damage, bounce back up 50 feet. Down 25 feet, down 15 feet, and then hit the ground. All while taking no damage. This feat is stupid. Reckless Abandon is such a great feat that I think it deserves to be read out verbatim. Reckless Abandon, a free action. Once per day. Despite a lifetime filled with questionable decisions, you've managed to survive. As though you have uncanny luck that lets you avoid the consequences of your own actions. For the remainder of your turn, if you roll a failure or critical failure on a saving throw against a harmful effect, you get a success instead. Further enemies and hazards that would damage you this turn roll the minimum possible damage. These benefits apply only to harmful effects incurred entirely during your turn in which you activate Reckless Abandon, such as running through a prismatic wall. Persistent damage and conditions that were applied prior to your turn proceed normally, and as soon as your turn ends, you are subject to the full consequences of any dangers still threatening you. The long and short of it is, as a free action, you can automatically succeed one harmful saving throw and then treat everything else as minimum possible damage for the rest of that turn. But should you be afflicted with anything that inflicts persistent damage or anything that hurts you after that turn ends, it's all normal full damage from there. This is incredible. This is so powerful. And like it said, running through a prismatic wall, you could just completely ignore it. If that's your one harmful saving throw, you burst through it and you automatically normal succeed. This is fantastic. I love goblins. I'll be honest. Before this video, I was not huge on goblins. I liked them. They were silly, and I always thought they were a bit more of the meme ancestor. You know, like, <laughs> I'm a silly goblin, I'm gonna take bouncy, and I don't take fall damage, and blah blah blah. But the more I've read up on them, and especially going through all of their feats, one after the other, in this format, the more respect I have for them. There are those silly meme feats, but you don't have to take those. There's some seriously respect respectable feats here, such as the one that lets you make two trip attempts for two actions at full bonus. That's awesome. Goblins are really, really rad, and I've made the mistake of overlooking them as a joke ancestry or just a silly ancestry. You can do some amazingly cool combos using the goblin ancestry. But what do you guys think? Do you love goblins? Do you hate goblins? I know the Pathfinder community adores goblins, so I'm expecting a lot of comments loving and praising them. But let me know if you hate goblins. What do you hate about goblins? What don't you like? What do you wish they would change? Are you playing a goblin right now? Tell me about your character down in the comments. I'd like to give a huge shout out to my patrons over there. Thank you guys so, so very much for supporting what I do. If you're interested in joining my Patreon, there are links in the description that'll take you right there. For as little as $5 a month, you get weekly exclusive content, whether it be early access to videos or completely unique homebrew for Pathfinder 2e, or just sometimes completely exclusive videos not available anywhere else. There are also links to my Discord and my Twitter, so feel free to check those out. Thank you all so very much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And until next time, no nat ones.